Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's podcast. Before I jump into the news, I just wanted to address the whole Patreon situation. Um, I don't want to get into the details, but I guess a lot of people were upset with the company Patreon, not interactions between creators, and or at least hopefully not with me. Uh, but I completely understand. Um, the company has pissed me off before. I've made, you know, I've been very public about what happened last year, and it really bothered me. So uh, anybody that wants to bail on Patreon and go to another one, uh, I signed up for the two others that I, the only two that I could find really, uh, Subscribestar, and then the YouTube one, YouTube's create or something. Um, I don't really know how to use either, but anybody that signs up for any of the supporter stuff will automatically be entered uh, or eligible for the giveaways. So you're still going to have to post in whatever it is that, uh, that you subscribe to, but that should work the same. You're still eligible for everything uh, that I do in the Q&As. So once again, just post wherever it is that you subscribe. And you still have access to the Discord server. So um, I just, you know, I am so unbelievably appreciative of all the Patreon subscribers and what it's allowed me to do and the interaction between everybody. A lot of really awesome people subscribe and, and hang out. So uh, I just, I don't really want that to end. And I especially don't want that to end because a company... Uh, is pissing people off. Regardless of right or wrong reasoning, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's, you know, it, 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 it's, it sucks even worse if I didn't do anything wrong and people are still pissed. So I completely sympathize. I totally understand. I'm not really happy with them for completely different reasons anyway. So I'm just going to sign up for whatever and people choose whatever is easiest for them if they want to subscribe and support. Uh, and I think I'm just going to start referring to all the extra stuff as the supporter giveaways, the supporter Q and A's. I think that's the most, um, you know, the most generic and respectful way I could put it. But you know, once again, I just have to thank everyone for all of the support because, you know, I think a lot of YouTubers get in the habit of, or, or any creators, of just thanking people at the end. And most seem to mean it, but I, I want to make sure everybody knows that I really, really mean it. Like, a lot of the, the wonderful things I've gotten to do and the people I've gotten to work with and some of the projects I've gotten to bring to light would have never happened if I didn't have support from people. So... Uh, hopefully I can keep this going as long as I can, but there's no way I could do it without you guys. So thank you so much for all your help and support. Um, if you want to continue to support me, do it wherever is the easiest for you. And we'll just work through this together. If one platform really sucks, if one's better, you know, uh, just all I ask is that you just let me know. Because there's no way I'd be able to know without you telling me. So once again, thank you so much. Um, I'll leave links to wherever is the easiest place for you to subscribe to me. And uh, just give me... But just be a little patient the first few weeks because I just still don't know how to use the other platforms. And I, I still barely know how to use Patreon because it doesn't really, it's not very user friendly. But <laughs> thanks again and uh, let's jump into the news. First up, TR Fightstick is working on Dreamcast replacement cases made out of both wood and metal. Uh, I believe that they're also going to be making versions that have the whole pre cut for DC HDMI. Uh, meaning that you could, if you wanted to do a no-cut mod on your Dreamcast, you could just save the original case and put it in one of these really awesome aftermarket ones. Um, I really do like stuff like this, and, uh, you know, it was the same thing with the Wii Duel. I found those clear cases to be absolutely amazing looking. I mean, as a nerd, I always want to see through my devices and be able to see the electronics. In most cases, some are just messy inside. Like, I wouldn't want a clear 32X, but... Um, you yeah, know, I do enjoy stuff like this. You know, save the original case, wrap it in some bubble wrap. Now you have it for whatever reason if you need it. Uh, and you get to have a pretty awesome, unique new case for it. And then, you know, stuff like this, add anything you want. Switches, drill some holes, whatever. Because uh, that's kind of the spirit of what these things are meant for. Um, there's no pricing or release date yet, but they're expected to be at least reasonably priced based on the metal Capcom CPS3 stuff. Um, and I, I just, I'm really interested to see more things like this. Uh, I can't wait to see if Greg comes out with something for a no-cut DC HDMI mod. I'd certainly love to see uh, another metal case for the G-SCART Switch. I believe my buddy Ben was working on that. Or heck, even a full plastic case. Uh, maybe I should send one to Greg and see if he'd be into it. But either way, um, th I mean, there's just, there's no downside to things like this. You know, put your console in it. If you, you know, now you have a, a piece of art as well as a working console, and if you don't like it, put it back the way it was. So uh, thanks to TR Fightstick to continue to make stuff like this, and I just, I hope more people do, because they're a lot of fun, and it just adds a little bit of unique customizations to something that 
you know, that has a lot of meaning to a lot of us. Insurrection Industries is now offering their GameCube digital port connector for sale separately. Um, when they first announced their Carby GC Video plug and play device, they said that they would soon be selling just the connector. Uh, and they kept their promise and put it up for sale. Let's see if I can get this in focus for people watching on YouTube. So it's the same very high quality, very strong and sturdy connector that is the most reminiscent of the original GC or GameCube digital uh, cables. And in my opinion, it's the best one that I've seen out of all of the plug and play solutions. Um, you know, I really think if people are doing their own do-it-yourself devices, this is probably one to pick up just because uh, as much as some of the other solutions and even Greg's 3D print solution was great, you still have to add all the pins manually. And uh, while the, you know, the 3D print solutions were certainly excellent and I, you know, I still hold them in high regard, it's just uh, we'd all probably want to spend our time doing things a little bit more productive than sticking pins inside. So um, anybody that's interested, uh, you could pick them up for about $12 with free shipping in the US. And they're small and light, so I imagine international shipping is probably pretty cheap. But uh, yeah, definitely something that I recommend. And uh, you know, anybody making their own solution, check it out. Greg Collins has made his 3D printed no cut mod ultra HDMI kits available for purchase from his eBay store. And I'm really happy he did this because while it's amazing that he puts all of his designs up on Thingiverse for download for free, um, some of us just don't have 3D printers or just want to pick up a kit. So uh, I'm really happy that, you know, hopefully he gets to make a few bucks off of these while uh, supporting all the people without 3D printers that really want these mods. So I'm a, a huge, huge fan of anything that can make a no cut mod. And uh, this, I've seen this in action. I've held one. It looks and works perfect. And in my personal opinion, there's no excuse for not using one of these and an ultra HDMI installation, 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 <laughs> both because, you know, you don't have to cut the plastic, but it also makes installation easier. So I strongly recommend people use it. It's very inexpensive. So either print your own, pick one of these up. But, uh, you know, thanks to Greg for making these available both for sale and for free for people with 3D printers. Someone just posted a video of getting HDMI output of their PS Vita via a Raspberry Pi. And it seems like a pretty neat um, proof of concept type of project. I don't think this would be for most people because if you really wanted to, you could use a PS TV for that. But uh, overall, it looks like there was 30 frames per second and one to two frames of latency. So something like this might be useful for other stuff as well. And it just seems like kind of a fun nerdy project that was worth mentioning, but uh, probably not the best capture solution for people looking to stream those games. But who knows, maybe it will evolve into something like that. Either way, it's pretty neat, so check it out if you're interested. Smoke Monster just posted a detailed and in-depth update of everything that's been going on with the Mr. FPGA project. I'm just gonna scroll down and kinda hit some of the highlights, but I highly recommend that anybody who's interested in this check out the main post. Uh, but there's a bunch of new arcade cores, such as Joust, Stargate, um, the Odyssey 2 core is coming soon. There was a ton of updates to the SNES core, and it looks pretty playable, in my opinion. Um, and there were a few main updates to uh, the scaler um, and some of the, the V-Sync adjustments and stuff like that. So, uh, and many of the other cores have been uh, talked about, as well as potential new reveals for newer ones. So, um, I would strongly recommend checking this out, and it's really honestly getting to the point where it's, uh, you know, it's just starting to get past tinkerers only. So for a while I've said, you know, if you enjoy tinkering and playing around and testing stuff, then, uh, you know, it's a great thing to have, but it's starting to really approach the point where I would suggest even people who aren't really, who don't really enjoy messing with things, get it, only load the stuff that's solid and working and just use it from there. Cause it's, uh, it's getting pretty cool. I just, uh, I would really like to see the controller adapter board uh, finished sooner rather than later and a cool new 3D case made around that. So uh, hopefully I could talk to the people involved and see if there's anything I could do to help speed that up because I think that's certainly one of the things that might be stopping people from picking up on the project is just having it look like a mini console with some controller inputs and a nice, you know, nice plastic case. But either way, massive and huge thank you to the entire team of people working on that stuff and to Smoke Monster for keeping us in the loop. Someone has just posted a free 3D print design for a Gemma Edge connector for arcades. Um, and I thought this was great because, you know, with 
JAMA boards and arcade boards, you have to move them around, uh, for people with super guns at least, you have to move them around a lot. And just anything to help protect the something that's going to be slotted in a lot, I think would be, certainly would be a good addition and certainly wouldn't hurt. Um, I spoke to John, the owner of Tasty Chicken in Brooklyn, who has a 3D printer and a bunch of arcade boards, and he said he tried printing it out, and it was a little bit of a tight fit on his, and he's been working with Greg Collins to try to see if they could uh, have different versions of it available for different thickness PCBs. So I wanted to show my arcade boards. I wasn't really sure if uh, this is going to show up on camera, but my UMK3 board, um, you could kind of see here, uh, I don't know if somebody added uh, solder to this or if it's just uh, something wrong with the connector, but that's a little bit thicker in that spot. So that connector wouldn't really, you know, it might not, you might want a looser connector for something like that. Uh, and funny, but um, I just purchased an MK1 consoleized kit uh, and it came with a JAMA connector that fits perfect. Uh, it was a little tight, so I just used uh, an X-Acto knife to scrape off some of the, uh, one of the 3D traces on the inside. But overall, I just, you know, uh, maybe ever, uh, people who have more insight into these things could chime in down in the comments. But for me personally, I just, I think having the peace of mind of having the connector covered is a good thing. Um, but I don't know. I mean, is it, is the extra... The extra addition of something scraping off the top of those, even if it's, you know, soft, light plastic, is that going to just wear it out faster? Is it good rather than bad? So hopefully we'll have the experts in the comments chiming in, letting us know what they think. Um, but I certainly like it and think it's a good idea. And uh, I'll keep everybody posted uh, if there's one major revelation or if there's a new version of this. But um, in my opinion, I would think that even if it's too loose, it's still better to have than not because, well, you know, this connector is kind of sticking out in the end here. What if I'm, uh, what if I go to put it down somewhere and this hits first? I'd rather have it hit and break a plastic cap than, uh, you know, than the PCB itself. But uh, yeah, so thank you to uh, Eva Wing Zero for posting the model. Thanks to John and Greg for testing it out and trying to tweak it. Uh, and thanks to Joel, who I got this awesome MK consoleized kit from. Uh, I can't wait to go continue playing. <laughs> There's been a ton of updates to the GameCube homebrew software Swiss in the past few weeks, with the latest version coming in at 5.2.8, and there is just a ton of awesome updates. So if anybody's unfamiliar, Swiss is a piece of software that allows you to launch uh, real GameCube discs as well as any kind of homebrew, as long as you have some way to boot it, the most common way being an action replay disc and an SD card loader. And uh, there's just way too many uh, updates and features to list for this one. So if, uh, if, you're, if you use the software, I recommend just checking out the post. Um, but one of the things that I believe I saw correctly is you're able to launch certain games that still have chroma shift issues with GC video. Uh, you could launch it in a way where it boots and shifts it over so you don't have those issues. Um, and that's been kind of a hard problem to trace down because some people just can't see the chroma shift as easily as others. I'm one of those people. I think this is one of the very few times that my weird form of color blindness has affected the work that I do. Uh, I think it's actually helped for some of the older games with, uh, you know, I think I, I see sharpness better, but um, I do have a hard time seeing these chroma shift issues. So there, it's been well documented though. I have links in the post for anybody that's interested. And I guess the bottom line is if you're a Swiss user, especially if you use it on SD card and not a DVD-R, just update. There's no excuse not to and you get all of these awesome features for free. So a massive team to the people that, uh, the whole Swiss team that works on this, um, Emu Kitted, Extrems, and I believe there were a few more contributors on this one. So thank you to everybody who contributes to this. And uh, you know, this is, by far, I think, I, I don't know if I can call it my favorite software for the GameCube because I think it's tied with the Game Boy interface because they kind of go hand in hand. Swiss allows you to easily pull more options out of the Game Boy interface using a GUI rather than a file. So I guess I could fairly say that Swiss and the Game Boy interface are my favorite softwares for the GameCube. And if you have the ability to launch Homebrew, you got to use them both. Sega just announced that the Genesis Classics Collection is coming to the Switch. 
Um, so I guess if you have a Switch user that has never played these games before, this is certainly the easiest way to experience them, but the past few Classics releases just haven't really impressed me. It's been the same old emulation over and over, so... You know, I guess for somebody that's never played them, this might be exciting, but uh, for people that were hoping for something other than just a generic re-release, uh, it seems pretty boring, so probably not for us. A while back, I saw that somebody had released a 3D print design that allows for Atari 5200 dual controller coupling. So I guess there's a few dual stick games, and uh, this is just a cool way to keep the sticks together. Uh, but I believe when I originally saw the post, the, the person said they didn't have a chance to try it out yet, and someone on Atari Age printed it and said, while it's not perfect, it seems to work fine for them. So if you have an Atari 5200, a 3D printer, and the, uh, you know, the desire to play dual stick games, seems like a, a really cool thing to give a try. Unseen has just released a new version of the GC Video firmware that addresses an audio bug. Um, in my opinion, if you already have a GC video solution and you don't have any complaints about it, I wouldn't bend over backwards to, to fix this. Um, if the audio is causing a problem with you, or if you're just one of those people that already has a programmer set up and you have an easy solution like the Carby that you could just pop the top off and plug it in, sure, why not? Give it a shot and program it, but this certainly isn't one that I would run out and worry about too much. Uh, but I'm very pleased that, you know, all of these updates are still being made and that Unseen really is just continuing the project. You know, it's really awesome. Um, I hope that there's going to be a firmware update soon to address some of the Chroma bugs. I know that Extrems was working on nailing down which games were still affected and what could be done. Um, I know that uh, if you use Swiss, you could set the screen position, as I mentioned before. Uh, or I believe you could even use the GameCube menu um, to shift it, but don't forget to change it back in the GameCube menu or then you'll have a chroma shift on the rest of your titles. Uh, personally, I would always just use Swiss for things like this. It's just awesome and easy. But uh, either way, um, you know, I'm very happy that there's still firmware updates happening and I hope that there's a version 2.5 at some point that gets the last of the chroma bugs. But other than that, I can't really imagine any updates needed past that. Uh, unless there's something I'm not seeing, but huge shout out and thank you to Unseen for continuing his work in this. Um, I guess there was a bit of drama about how to refer to Unseen, but I was always under the impression that, uh, you know, his screen name is how I should. Um, I, I reached out to him, uh, Ingo, Ingo, I'm um, sure any of my German friends, please correct me on how to, uh, how to say it. I've always said Ingo, but I'm an American, so I probably say that wrong, but... Yeah, if anybody knows him, um, you know, I asked him and didn't hear back, so please let me know the proper way to address him. You know, and I always try to bend over backwards to use the correct terms and pronunciations for people, because I just, you know, I, I can't always get it right, but I feel like it's respectful for at least trying. So it really bothered me when I thought maybe I was accidentally referring to him improperly this whole time, but it's an honest mistake. So, uh, unseen. Ingo, Ingo, um, please tell me which, <laughs> what you would prefer and I will, uh, I will correct myself in the future. Genuinely sorry about that. And speaking of GC Video, My Life in Gaming just did a really awesome and thorough episode that goes through all of the main solutions available today. Uh, and, you know, I just, uh, their videos are always top notch, but sometimes they really, really nail it. And I think this is definitely one of those. Um, you know, uh, anybody that's interested at all in what solutions are best for you now, uh, their opinions, I agree with 100%. I think um, as far as based on the solutions you have now, uh, unless you are really do-it-yourselfer that enjoys projects like that, I would absolutely stick with the plug-and-plays. If you just need HDMI, I would recommend the Carby because it's good quality and low price. Um, if you just need a component, I would recommend checking out Insurrection's component-only cable that should be around next month. And if you need both, the Mark II from Eon seems to take care of everything that you'd need. So uh, great video, lots of great examples and stuff. So, uh, you know, excellent work by both of those guys. Thank you very much to My Life and Gaming for, for making kick-ass videos like this. Um, and I think at least, you know, until the next big thing comes, if there even is one, that should be the go-to for what to know about GC Video. There's now a rechargeable battery do-it-yourself kit available for the Game Boy Advance called the Power Up Advance. Uh, and it's a kit that ranges from 20 to 33 plus shipping. 
um, that could ha install into your GBA that gets about six or seven hours of playtime. Um, and that is including an AGS 101 backlit screen. So I believe they tested that with original carts, not some of the power hungry things like an EverDrive. But that's still, uh, in my opinion, really awesome. Um, to be honest, the only complaint I have is that it's a kit. It comes completely unassembled and I, I believe you need to solder everything together. Uh, I read it a couple times to make sure and it just doesn't really make any sense to me because if you could order a bulk of PCBs and components, then you could order a PCBA from a company and have them made for you and just charge the, you know, charge whatever the difference is. So it's the only downside I would think is that, you know, it stinks that they, you can't just buy this kit and install it. You have to solder all the little components. And while I certainly can, I don't, I don't like to, <laughs> you know, I know that sounds like a, a shitty thing to say, but you know, I, I enjoy researching and testing and making the videos and doing the writing. I don't love soldering projects. So hopefully somebody will, uh, will talk to them or, or make their own version of this. Um, the only thing is you do need to cut the back plastic of uh, the plastic battery door of the GBA. So just do yourself a favor and spend $1.70 on a new back cover and cut that, not the original. <laughs> you know, I, I, the no-cut mod thing is kind of important, and uh, I think a lot of other people are starting to realize the importance of it as well. So if you want to pick one of these up, spend the time soldering it together, just spend an extra few bucks on a new cover. But... Overall I, think, uh, overall, I think it's really cool that you could have an original GBA with a backlit screen, a rechargeable battery, and have the whole uh, experience right like that. Because while I love the GBA SP, I do prefer the feel of the original one. So it kind of like, you kind of get all the advantages of the original in this. Nintendo North America's president, Reggie, just confirmed in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter that after this holiday season, they will no longer be making either of the classic consoles. So if uh, you are still looking to pick one up, there are still major retailers that have them for original price or even maybe a bit cheaper, depending. But um, I would say, you know, even if you were on the fence about getting one, just buy one now because they're going to go skyrocketing in price. I picked up one of each, even though I have no desire to play the consoles. I just know that at some point in the next year or two, somebody I know is going to really need one for something. So I figured I would just pick one up and, you know, leave it in my friend's basement in storage or something like that. But um, it, the only thing that's kind of disconcerting about this is... They apparently will be selling older games on the Switch in the future, but it's going to only be through the Switch Online subscription service, um, which means that once your subscription ends, you lose the access to the games, and it also means that if you don't continuously log in, you also lose access to the games, which is, you know, it's obviously done to prevent piracy and stuff like that. That part I understand, but it's a little weird that I can imagine a ton of scenarios in which somebody might not connect their Switch to the internet as frequently as, as they should, and then go away on a trip somewhere and lose access to the games that they are paying for. So that's a little, you know, that's a little strange. And also, I gotta say, um, maybe I'm just turning into a, a grumpy old tinfoil hat wearing old guy, but... Uh, I, I feel like Reggie is the master of not answering a question. I feel like he is as good or better than every other big corporation or politician I've ever seen in my life. And the one that really struck me in this interview was when uh, the Hollywood Reporter asked, um, how do most people use their Switch, in docked mode or in, in um, uh, just handheld mode? And I, maybe they were trying to set him up for something. Maybe he did the right thing by answering this way. But I just took that as a genuine question because I never use my Switch in handheld mode. I'm always only in docked mode. Um, and his answer was, it was such a skirt the answer, you know, uh, answer a question with a question type of thing. I think he said something like, that's not a metric that matters to them. There's other things that they track. And it's just, it, as soon as he didn't give a direct answer, my brain always goes, well, what's he hiding? What are they tracking? And not that I really care. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not really a private person. I put my life on the freaking internet twice a week at least. So I'm not worried about that for me personally. I just wonder, like, when, when you get answers like that that are so vague and it creeps me out, I wonder what it is that they're hiding. Probably nothing. He's probably just trained at marketing and PR and he just has this burned into him. But, 
yeah, any thoughts on that? Uh, am I really just slowly going crazy, or is, uh, did anybody else feel as creeped out as I did when he skirted the answer to some of those questions like that? I'm interested in people's opinions, and I, I have, certainly have no problem admitting if I'm just being a weirdo. <laughs> Simon from the Domesday Duplicator Project has just uploaded a video of him demoing the Apple Visual Almanac Interactive LaserDisc System. Wow, I got that right in the first try. Uh, but basically, you have to take a compatible LaserDisc player, use a serial cable to plug it into an Apple computer, uh, and then use both software on the computer and the original LaserDisc to control the LaserDisc player to get access to your visual almanac. Um, and while it's kind of funny, because nowadays you can just whip out your phone and two, two button pushes later, you could have something that you could pinch and zoom and go through. But uh, it's kind of cool to see the original working, but the purpose of this is to contribute more work to his Domesday Duplicator project, where you'll be able to archive the entire LaserDisc and maybe use it in a way where you could recreate this experience using something like the DE10 Nano uh, rather than have the original LaserDisc. So I really appreciate it when people take the time to try to preserve the more obscure and weird stuff that we've seen over the years because while it might not seem like a big deal now, and in fact it might seem laughable and archaic compared to what we have, uh, I guarantee there's going to be a point where we look back and really want to just to see and enjoy what, what it was like for a little while while we were, as humans, going through this tradition from, you know, the, uh, from the different technological advances and especially over the last hundred years. Um, and if anybody isn't familiar with the project or doesn't really know a lot of the things I just mentioned, please, please check out the interview I did with Simon and Chad. Um, I just, it, I really enjoyed that I got to, uh, to bring that project to light, even, even uh, in a small way. I just think that's something that more people should, uh, should know about, and I think more people would contribute to it if they even knew it existed. So please check out that interview and uh, support Simon and Chad's project in any way you can, because I, I love to see things like this archived, and that way we could really preserve this stuff for the future. And I'd also like to see this project get ported over to VHS tapes. Because uh, that's something that I think all of us might have some little story of some kind about uh, how or why you would want a VHS tape perfectly backed up as good as possible. So please check it out. There is another update to the PSIO project, the uh, PlayStation Optical Drive Emulator. There's now a new menu and a new firmware with a few updates and bug fixes. Um, and I believe now you have to enter your serial number and your order number in order to get access to the updates. So, uh, you know, I'm really, really happy and appreciative that the project is continuing to be updated, that the performance isn't uh, continuing to, to go up. Um, you know, there was the audio fix a few firmwares ago, and that's all great and positive, but, uh, you know, we should be working to make these things easier to update, not harder. So I don't know what the issue is with uh, the customer service side of things, but uh, Matt, I believe, is the owner. Please reach out to me if you're watching this. Um, you know, my email is all over the place. You could find me, but uh, I'll try my best to help. Uh, I just, we should be making these things easier to upgrade. I've had a lot of people contact me since the first time I mentioned the update two weeks ago, saying, you know, they're, they're not getting emails responded to. They can't get their PSIO updated that they bought, that they were one of the original purchasers. A few people had bought some off of eBay and now they can't update theirs because they can't get a hold of the original eBay seller. It's just, uh, it seems to be a complete nightmare for at least a few people and people that I know. So not just internet trolls looking to, to snowball effect some drama. I actually know uh, at least three or four people that have the, exactly what I described and I've read a few more talking about it. So, uh, you know, I. I really like the project. Um, I really hope it continues to get some updates, but maybe take a pause on the updates and, and check on the customer service side of things. Cause you know, I just, I don't want to see a project like this go away, but time does need to be spent making sure that people who have already purchased are getting what they bought. People have found an alternative power supply that can be modded to work in a Neo Geo CD. So I guess, um, Original PSUs are hard to find and kind of expensive. So somebody had figured out that you can use an old HP power supply. You just need to mod it. 
Um, I believe you need to change the voltage from 12 volts to 10 volts and switch two pins around. So it's by no means a plug and play solution. But if you're somebody who's comfortable with tinkering and wants to save a few bucks, or maybe you just live in a place where it's much easier to get these than it is to get an original Neo Geo CD PSU, you certainly have another option. So uh, while this one isn't for everybody, it was definitely worth mentioning. Akari has just uploaded the latest official firmware for the SD to SNES. Version 1.9.0 includes the SA1 chip support that Red Guy has just developed, as well as some bug fixes and uh, other overall improvements. So uh, massive thank you to Akari, as well as all of the people who have uh, contributed some very cool stuff to the SD to SNES. Of course, especially Red Guy. Um, and it's just, if you own one of these, there's, you have to update it. It takes two seconds, you have all of this new functionality, you might as well. So thanks very much to everybody who was involved in these things. The Blissbox team just showed off a prototype of a device they're calling a bridge that sits between the Blissbox itself and modern consoles. In this video, they showed a GameCube controller running through the Blissbox, through the bridge, into a Nintendo Switch. Um, they also said that total lag is expected to be around 5 milliseconds, which, if that's true, that's pretty impressive considering that it probably has to go through two conversions total in order to get to that point to get to the Switch. So um, that's pretty impressive in itself. And anybody unfamiliar with the Bliss Box, um, this is a device that allows you to take original controllers from pretty much every console, uh, purchase an adapter, plug that adapter into the Bliss Box, and then the Bliss Box into a USB device, such as computers, Raspberry Pis, the Mister, um, and PlayStation 3, and I believe Xbox 360. So hopefully the bridge would allow compatibility with some of the newer consoles. Maybe we can get it on you know, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Switch. But, uh, and maybe it could be used for other things as well. Who knows, maybe the bridge could be used to have um, PS3 only con uh, controllers also be used in the PS4 or stuff like that. But um, either way, I'll, uh, I'll let everybody know when the official release date is and what the pricing is, but so far they say available in 2019. And lastly, Marshall has just uploaded a new firmware for the N64 Ultra HDMI. The changes in this one are both full range and limited range RGB outputs are available, which will be a help for certain people's TVs that require certain settings. Also, there's a new 1600 by 1200 mode with 5x integer scaling, which is pretty cool for people that use monitors, or, or I guess possibly even 4K TVs. Um, I've yet to try one out, but I think that would be a pretty cool addition. And uh, the direct mode has been updated to bypass all buffering. And that's something that I think, once there is an HDMI scaler that is designed with retro gaming in mind, I think direct modes for all of these HDMI mods are things that are going to be really, truly appreciated. That way, uh, the longevity of the console could really be uh, extended a lot longer, because now you just get a true digital-to-digital -digital output of the signal that gets sent to a new processor that you can do whatever you want with. Uh, so theoretically, it would be even clearer than doing that with the analog output because it stays in the digital realm the whole time. So uh, thanks to Marshall for implementing that. Hopefully I could talk Kevtris into implementing that in his um, uh, high def nest project as well. But uh, either way, it's a cool update. And uh, it, as long as you have the ability to, you should update your Ultra HDMI kits right away. Well, that's it for this week. As always, thanks to all of the contributors who write articles on Retro RGB, as well as all of the amazing supporters that support the site, support myself, and all of the other creators. Because these couldn't happen without you, so genuinely and honestly, thank you so much. See you guys next time.